Hey guys, how's it going? Kevin Cleary here with a knife video for you. Today we've got uh, a top 10, list, top 10 list combined with uh, a little bit of a discussion. Had a talk with someone recently about high-end knives and, and looking for a bit of direction in terms of, you know, what they might look at to, you know, move on from, you know, they've got a, a few Spydercos and Kershaws, maybe Benchmade, Cold Steel, whatever. So they've done sort of the, the typical nicer brands, but to they're wondering about how to take the the next step up and so uh, i thought i want i'd talk about that a little bit and kind of uh, work through first of all a definition of high-end uh, and then i think we're going to narrow it down to high-end production um, with you know leaving some other op options available as well and then finally i will get to my list of what i believe to be the very best of those high-end options high-end production options uh, so the first thing that uh, i think we need to acknowledge is that there are various things that people mean by high-end to some people this is a really high-end knife to some people this is a really high-end knife you know this uh you know this Benchmade is not crazy expensive, but once I've added some nicer materials to it and, and you know, made some changes, that puts it certainly into a high-end price category. Um, so what do we mean by high-end? Is he looking for different materials, right? Is it uh, zirconium or Damascus or Timascus? Maybe just titanium. Uh, you know, maybe he just wants to go to like a titanium frame lock, um, which is, of course, something you do see, you know, most of the higher-end knives I talk about, I think, with minor exceptions, will be titanium frame locks. Um, so is it just, you know, does he just want titanium with a high-end steel? Because you can get that in some pretty reasonably priced um, priced knives. I think I had a Maguren on a few weeks ago that was, you know, titanium and M390. Um, <clears throat> this is titanium and S30V and isn't crazy expensive. I mean, wow. Um, 20 CV and isn't crazy expensive. You know, this is kind of you know, you could, uh, you could certainly debate about whether or not to call this high end, depending on who you are and what your price point is and what knives you've already experienced. Uh, by the way, this is zero tolerance, zero three oh eight. This is the Benchmade Crooked River. And this is of course the Spyderco Paramilitary too. Um, so is he looking for higher end materials? Is he looking for features? Maybe it's a knife with multi-row bearings or needle bearings, or maybe it's just a knife with really good action. All right. Is it extremely tight tolerances? Is it a distinctive mechanism? Okay. Like the, uh, like the detent mechanism found on sharp by design, uh, knives. This of course being the mini Tempest that we had in a video the other day. Uh, is it handwork? Something like uh, on this Arno Bernard uh, iMamba where the blade is is hand ground, right? What, what exactly do we mean by high end? Maybe it's another option, which is, uh, you know, if we bring a couple of these knives, which will possibly come back on the list, okay? You know, maybe what he's thinking of is more limited availability and uh, a certain amount of exclusivity, something like the uh, Mini Tempest or the iMamba, right? Where everybody isn't just going to have one because it takes a little time and effort to get your hands on on one of these. Um, you know, so maybe it's like small run, limited production, you know, personal customization. Uh, here's a good example. The uh, wow. The McNeese uh, PM, this one's the, the three inch, it is, there is a 3.5 inch as well, but this is a pretty good example, um, this Mac 2 of a personalized finish that's a little bit different than what you're often going to be getting. Um, so perhaps that's the kind of thing that he has in mind. And, and so the one thing I will say is notice I haven't really put performance on the list and really even good action probably doesn't define a high-end knife anymore because there are so many budget knives that have phenomenal action. And in fact, even in terms of performance and features, you can find a lot of what used to be considered very high-end features on much less expensive knives these days, right? Um, so in terms of performance and, and increasing the, the, the way a knife is going to function, you know, you probably tap that out around $150, $200. Um, you know, and I think of things like the Real Steel Megalodon or the Real Steel Lynx, both of which were mind-blowing 
blowingly good. I don't have either of them, so we'll bring in this uh, little Luna to sort of be the real steel representative. Okay, um, but there, there are some phenomenal, phenomenal knives out there that don't cost a crazy amount of money. All right. Um, in addition to now, by the way, I have some personal preferences around, you know, the things that I like to see in a knife. And we can talk about some of those. Um, I may mention some specifically uh, in a second. I may make a whole separate video about this, but I'll, I'll touch on that anyway. But uh, before we, we move away from that, uh, I, you know, I think of certain brands, right? Maybe he's looking for a small production company like TRM or Tactile Knife Co or Quiet Carry or Vero Engineering. And I know some of those use an OEM, but my point is that, you know, these are sort of boutique brands where they're not everywhere. They cost a little bit more. All right. We already mentioned that mainstream brands like Spyderco, um, actually, I guess we haven't mentioned, but, uh, you know, you don't have to go to a specialty brand that just does high end knives. Like it doesn't, it's not like Chris Reeve or um, Hinder or something like that are the only companies doing high end knives. Uh, here's a Spyderco Swayback, which is high ish end, okay. Um, and I, th you know, we had the, the 0308 a second ago, uh, but here's sort of Kershaw's high-end line. Here's a high-end option from Spyderco. They've, they've been like the ben Benchmade Anthem. There was the Spyderco um, Paisan, if you recall, the uh, the Resenti collaboration. There was, um, what am I forgetting? Anyway, that's, that's you know, just to, the, to throw the examples out there that, that oftentimes, uh, companies like Spyderco and Kershaw do do some high-end stuff. All right. And then in addition to those, we haven't really even touched on the fact that there are, you know, what are considered custom knives that are sort of like production customs, right? Curtis Knives is a good example. He has the, the F series of knives, Curtis F3. Um, this is a knife that, that has been you know, Curtis Knives have been making for years. They kind of know what they're doing. It's an established model. You know what you're getting. They, it's very repetitive. Uh, another good example would be like the Demco 8020 or the 10 or the 15, the Resenti Paisan or Snafu. Um, they have been some, there have been some changes. Um, Oz Machine Co. is another good example where it's, it's essentially the same knife over and over again. So it's a small maker producing um, one particular model or a few particular models over and over again. And at that point, you know, that's sort of a production custom. All right. So that's another aspect to high end knives that, that needs to be kind of put in our, put in our mind and, and put in our bank of consideration when it comes to, you know, what am I going to buy as a high end knife? Oh, you know, which one I forgot to throw in here. Um, even cold steel has done this, right? Uh, the cold steel four max is definitely a high end offering from cold steel, better materials, a uh, little tighter fit and finish. Now the, this is the USA made one. And, and you guys know this did have a bit of a, a bump up with the lock and, and it had to be sent away to be, uh, for some changes to be made anyway. You guys get the point, right? I'm trying to be fairly broad in terms of consideration when it comes to high end knives. And really, guys, I do struggle myself to know how to categorize or even if to categorize uh, a number of these different options. Like, do I really make a big, do I really clearly delineate a major difference between something like the Formax, the you know, Incosi or the Savenza. Oh, I just dropped the knife. I want to show you, so we'll use a different example. Um, or the um, Mini Tempest, right? Do I do I say, well, so that one of these is you know a production knife. One of them is a custom knife. One of them is a mid tech knife. Like, really, the fact is that once I'm spending a decent amount of money, I have pretty high expectations, and I like to see certain things happening. All right, and and so um, I don't really care. Uh, how or who is producing these particular knives, right? If you want $500, uh, whether you made it or someone else did, it better be fantastic. Like you better not make any mistakes at that price point. Um, so 
perhaps we could simplify this whole discussion down to, you know, knives that are nearly perfect at being what they're at doing what they're supposed to do. That might actually be a pretty good definition of high end. Although, you know, there, there would be some civivis and stuff that, that kind of qualify. All right. Now, having gone through all of that by the way we're going to focus on folders i just wanted to add that because there's some pretty high-end fixed blades as well so <laughs> having now thrown all of that data at you i first of all i hope it gives you a number of categories to consider if you're looking for a high-end knife but now we can i think have enough background to sort of go into the list of of what i want to discuss i'm going to throw a couple of knives in here that aren't going to be on the list, but are high-end-ish, okay? And the reason I'm throwing them in there is just so you have something to look at. I'm gonna have to roll some pictures in here of some of the knives that I'm gonna talk about. And the first knife that I'm gonna put on this list is the Holt Spectre, all right? And really anything from Holt knives could, could qualify as very high-end, highly sought after, very well done in terms of fit and finish and tolerances and and in terms of you know being a really really great well balanced edc high-end edc you know the holts do a great job and i was lucky enough to to handle one of the first ones that came into canada i had a, a fellow knife enthusiast i don't have permission to share his name so i'll just leave it out but um a fellow enthusiast who is a fan of the channel contacted me and said, Hey, I've got a whole specter on the way. Do you want me to ship it to you and let you do a review of it before passing it along? And so I was pretty happy to do that. Did some research, found out, Hey, this could be pretty interesting in terms of the knife that I'm going to get my hands on here. And actually that was the only time I've done, I've done a fair bit of writing for, um, for publication, but that was the only time I've ever done any writing for publication in the knife industry. Uh, so I ended up writing an article on the Holt Spectre that, that found its way into Knife News back when it was more of an actual Knife News site, not just a, a marketing tool. It was still a marketing tool back then as well, but they, they also had some stories that were, were more knife interest. Anyway, all of that out of the way, Holt Spectre, great consideration, very hard to get. Uh, very expensive these days. Uh, you know, this is one of those knives, and there's going to be a lot of this on this list. At at table price, a Holt Spectre is an okay knife. It's still a little steep for what you're getting, and I think there are some other options that uh, I might want to consider. Like, I'm not rushing out to buy a Holt Spectre. Even if I knew I could get one at table price, I probably wouldn't buy one. But um, they are very, very nice and a good representation of what a high-end knife should be. The next knife that I want to put on the list is really not a knife, but a company. And that, of course, is going to be the... Uh, that is, the company is going to be Chris Reeve Knives. So I happen to have my Tanto in Kosi here, which I love um, and carry all the time. Chris Reeve Knives is doing a couple of things that are unique even among these higher end knives, and that is they tend to be more thoughtful, right? And one of the things that bugs me about the whole high end market is there, there are like a bunch of features that you could just throw together and be like, yeah, I'm making a high end folder. Um, you know, you put your, your slight modification to the typical design on it and call it a day. Right, so most of the time when we're talking about a high-end knife, we're going to see ceramic bearings, uh, lock bar insert, ceramic detent ball, um, you know, some kind of smooth action, likely a titanium frame lock. Uh, perhaps the titanium will be finished in various ways. You're going to have some kind of uh, stop pin mechanism. All right, you're going to have a way to stop this blade from spinning up backwards. But really, you know, you can buy a lot of these parts just at you know, one, you can buy them from machine shops in China who are just churning out this crap. And, and you know, you could go online, buy all this stuff and just assemble your sort of high-end knife um, fairly easily, which that, that bothers me a little bit. I feel like if I'm spending a lot of money, I want something better than that. I want a step up from, you know, yeah, I ordered all these parts online and put them together in my garage. Um, 
Okay, not that that's a bad thing, but I, I like to see some innovation. And, and Chris Reeve definitely does some things that no one else is doing. Uh, look at this stop pin, for instance. It's huge, and it spins to reduce wear and tear. Look at the way that they've done this plunge grind and even the grind itself. Like You can sharpen this knife for years, and it's going to continue to be functional. The size of the pivot, the way that they've done these massive bronze washers, which add a huge amount of lateral stability here. Like this stuff is, no one is doing that. And because of that, you know, Chris Reeve gets a really, really high level of attention on this list. And other high makers, I wish they would do something different, right? When, when Shirogorov started doing needle bearings in their knives, like that's amazing. That's something really, really in, impressive. And by the way, they are on the list. Um, and, and so that's the kind of stuff that really excites me. Another titanium frame lock with all the same parts and features of every other previous titanium frame lock is hard to get excited about at this point. Now there's going to be a bunch of them on the list anyway, anyway but uh, there you have it. So Chris Reeve, you know, does stand out among these high-end knives as doing something different and special. And I think because of that deserves a little more attention than some of these other companies. Uh, Microtech is a good example of a high knife company. And I included them here because one, again, they're a little bit different. Uh, they do a bunch of stuff that you're not going to always see on every knife. Um, again, I don't have a Microtech here, so I'll, I'll keep the last knife here and add just some visual whatever. Um, but I'll, I'll roll in some pictures as we go, as I said. Um, so Microtech is a good example of a high-end company and Protech as well is doing some pretty impressive stuff. I don't have a lot of examples because these guys focus on automatic knives, especially out the front automatics from Microtech. You know, um, Protech has a bunch of out the side automatics, but all automatics are illegal in Canada. I, if I lived in the States, I'd have some out the side, but I don't love out the front automatics anyway, because they always have blade play other than, um, other than uh, one example, and I just the name is evading me right now. But uh, also, I'll apologize in advance for that. But say, you know, Microtech is a good high-end company, small batch production. You know, they can be pretty hard to get your hands on, uh, and generally they're pretty well built. Now I know some of the older um, SOCOMs have have blade play. In fact, I've heard people say every older SOCOM has blade play, which is not ideal. But the Kona, uh, Microsoft uh, Microtech generally does a pretty good job and so does ProTech and you might want to look at that if you're looking for something high end something to to step up a little bit from you know a, a Spyderco or a, or a Kershaw. Uh, the the next one middle of the pack here um, and these are really not in rank order in fact you know as I just said you know I'd rank Chris Reeve higher than almost all of these because they're doing some innovative things. Um, Koenig Arius is of course, like the crown jewel of high-end knives at the moment. Um, now, they come in at the middle of the pack for a couple of reasons. One, they're not easy to get. Two, they're quite expensive. And, you know, just to think of a quite expensive, the plainest Gen 4 Arius you can buy is going to be six seventy-five. dollars All right, now I know inflation has gone crazy right now, and that price probably reflects that. So three or four years ago, that would be more like a $550 knife. I, I get that. Um, 675 is still hard to hard for me to spend on a knife. Um, if you want one, you're gonna have to have a, you're gonna have to look quite a bit. Um, there are a couple of Facebook groups though that would help you if you really wanted one of these. Um, join the Koenig discussion Facebook. Join the Koenig discussion group because they will often tell you when drops are happening at what stores, and you can join the Koenig buy and sell, and that's where there's a pretty healthy secondary market, in addition to blade forums and and a couple of other places. So uh, Koenig Arius, great knife. I'm not debating that it's not. That I'm not trying to say that it's not a good knife. A little expensive, a little hard to get, which you know turns me off a little bit. Um, Hinderer. So I don't have a an XM18 in the collection right now, so I'll roll one in. Uh, I do have, um, I do have an Emmet. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, so I do have a Hinderer here, just not an XM18. Um, but yeah, Hinderer does a very nice job despite the woefully soft steel. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so I, I thought, uh, you know, just so happened that I'm making this video at the same time everyone's freaking out. Um, 
So apparently there was a, a test done on an XM18 and it came back as, you know, a little bit low on Rockwell hardness. Now, not way low, uh, but a, a little bit low. In fact, it came in, came back with invariance of the Rockwell testing machine. Uh, Rick Hinderer, as he's prone to do, freaks out and, you know, threatens legal action and all this kind of stuff. Um, the other party, who his name I can't remember right now, uh, isn't going to back down. So... <laughs> He says, you know, I stand by my test, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I. <sighs> you kind of go, okay, um, whatever. Uh, you know, I will say this about Rick Hinder. You know, having heard some stories about interacting with him, he sounds like if you've ever, if you're, if you're familiar at all with Jordan Peterson, he talks about, or or really with you know the the ocean model for personality types. Um, you know, you know that there are people who are very disagreeable and Rick Hinderer by all accounts has that very disagreeable personality type. And that means he's not going to get along with everyone. He's going to have problems. And in a public public space like the knife community, that's going to lead to some drama from time to time. So I think that's part of just what's happening right now. That said, most of the time, Hinderer knives are very good. Um, you know, the ones that I've had, I've enjoyed immensely, including this one. This is one of my favorite uh, knives in my collection. I know I said I was going to focus on folders, and so you're going to have to pretend that this is an XM18, and, you know, I can it, it can fold, even though, yeah, it's clearly not. All right, so uh, Hinderer is definitely on the list. If you want to pick up a high-end folder, you're going to be wanting to look at, you know, an XM18 or, you know, some of his other um a half track or, or jurassic or whatever other hinder you you want to take a look at now i do want to add one that probably doesn't come to most people's minds they're a little newer um and again this is a knife that i was fortunate to have fairly early on uh, arno bernard is a south american company they do mostly fixed blades in n690 steel which you know i was a little you know i, I hate they're pretty expensive for the steel that they use. However, this is in RWL 34, which is a little bit better. But I think this definitely qualifies as a pretty high-end knife. You know, it's hard to get small batch production. There's some handwork involved. In fact, you know, they're hand grinding these blades and doing a phenomenal job because they are absolutely beautiful. Let me just show you. Look at that. That blade is a, a piece of artwork that also happens to be slightly hollow ground, meaning it cuts like crazy. And yeah, so very, very nice knife and certainly qualifies as a high-end option that, um, that I think I'm pretty comfortable suggesting people take a look at. All right, now again, we're looking at folders. Arnold Bernard does not have a lot of folders, but uh, there are some out there. Now, I wanted to make a point here about mm, some companies that I don't know what to tell you about. <laughs> so Zero Tolerance, uh, Best Tech, um, Concept Knives. Uh, these are some sort of mid-tier companies. Obviously, Concept and Best Tech are overseas. Uh, Zero Tolerance is going to be made in the U.S. Um, either way, you know, the level of quality is going to be similar on those. And, and they're not... Some of their work is very good. Best Tech, for example, makes the the Vero engineering stuff, and they do a great job. But I, but I, and they did a really nice job with the Tagata from uh, Morgan Cohen's, who's also the designer on this knife. Concept has done a really nice job on this. I'm going to make some changes here, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, um, I, I throw these in as potential considerations, while also saying these are probably Concept, Best Tech, and ZT are probably not quite what you're looking for where i would say you know what the knives that i would say you're probably more leaning toward are going to be uh we knives riot custom knife factory uh these are the overseas makers that i would class i would categorize as a, a touch above a little more high end um we knives does a great job they they you know the the machining is nice the detail is nice the they can be a little bit plain sometimes not always um the action is always spectacular i would love to see we knives start 
departing a little bit from their pattern. Right now, we knives has fallen into sort of a, a particular thing where, you know, the action is going to be good, the detent is going to be good, you know, it's but it's going to be a pretty typical titanium frame lock at this point. I would love to see them coming in with needle bearings or multi-row ceramic bearings or, uh, you know, those two things, maybe some some innovative locking mechanisms, you know, instead of, you know, for example, the the Wii, the Snex Buster, the collaboration. Um, the biggest disappointment, disappointment there for me was they didn't use the the lock like the lock was the thing that made that such a spectacular knife and we just made it a regular titanium frame lock which was a little disappointing um riot is a great example they kill in this particular element and i would say if if you just want to experience a really good high-end knife Riot is what you want to be looking at. Um, they do a great job, whether it be OEM work like this um, Sharp by Design Mini Tempest, or whether it be their in-house stuff like this um, uh, Torrent, uh, the Chavez stuff, there's Leong Ma stuff, uh, Brian, uh, there's uh, Todd Bag stuff made by Riot. Like they, Riot does a bunch of different, does knives for a bunch of different makers, and they do a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Um, I would like to see some features. Again, I feel like a broken record here, but uh, out of all the knives I've shown you, other than um, the Chris Reeve here, which has some special, interesting features. All right, the, the features are something that I want to touch on. So here we have this mini Tempest that's got the proprietary integrated detent system that Brian uh, invented, and it is fantastic. I love the way this works. Now, I would wish that they'd add dual row or needle bearings to this. Uh, this knife has a couple things going on that I really, really love, especially in this area. Okay, so we do have dual row ceramic bearings and it feels phenomenal. And I've had this knife for quite a long time and there's not much that I've had come through my hands that has better action. Um, you very, uh, you know, I could name maybe two or three knives. Um, the other thing that this knife does that's great is notice that the the bearing system here or the the way the weight is uh, the way the lockup works spreads the loads out really really well so we have the lock bar pushing up on this blade keeping it open when i push down on this i've got these giant studs that are going to have to push into the frame to just so one their size and the shape of where they connect distributes that load really well not only that but because of the pivot and the tension and the location of these stop pins side to side play if you loosened off if you loosened off this pivot you still wouldn't get side to side play because the the way the knife locks up actually increases its strength um, so uh, those are just some some details that I wanted to point out. I know this is a stinking long video. And then finally, Custom Knife Factory. Come to Custom Knife Factory um, is very very well done. Again, they're small batch. They're more expensive. Okay, they're much more expensive than Riot knives these days. And I don't think they're bringing all that much more to the table. They claim they get the parts from China, then assemble them in Russia. Whether they do or not is besides the point. Uh, they work with some really nice makers. Like they did the Snafu a couple of years ago, which was a very nicely done knife. They've had a few others. The the uh, um, anyway doesn't matter. They've they've had some really good exclusive um, maker relationships that are very impressive, uh, and they do a great job implementing those. Finally, let's touch on the last two. Um, Shirogorov made and assembled in Russia. These are fantastic knives. They do do some interesting things with their pivots, needle bearings, multi-row, like two-row and three-row uh, ceramic bearings, which are fantastic, highly enjoyable knives. Probably some of the most perfect actions you're going to get on a knife uh, with that added stability of the needle bearings as well, which is just great. And then the last company that I want to mention, I'm going to have to um, throw in some pictures here because I don't have a knife from the Grimsmo's, but Grimsmo Knives has got to be on this list because they are doing something really spectacular. I'm just going to throw my Formax in so the screen's not empty. Um, they have really tried to pull out all the stops to try and build the absolute most perfect, precise thing that they can. All right, they have two models, the Norseman and the Rask in terms of knives. They also have a pen. But they have spared no expense. And, and the, 
that's a blessing and a curse. Okay. The blessing is it's really cool to, to have someone just trying to go as high, as tight of tolerance as they possibly can get. And it, it's almost like an experiment in perfection. Now you will pay dearly for that experiment. Okay. I think the starting price for like a plain Jane knife from them is $900, which is not, cr it's a little crazy. They used to be 600 bucks. And I think at 600 bucks, that was a pretty good price. If they'd gone up to like 700, I get that they wouldn't have dealt with supply and demand. And they're definitely, you know, there's definitely, there definitely was at least quite a bit of demand for knives from them. It has slowed down so that you see a f more frequency of knives coming available and, and, uh, you know, people wanting to to sell off their spot on on the list. All right, um, and that's by the way, that's how Grimsma works. If you want to buy one of their knives, you sign up. They use a random draw, and they they rent they draw from the list of names. When your list name comes up, they offer you whatever knife they have at the time, and then you can either accept or decline. Um, great knives. The Rask is the, the more appealing of the two to me, but the problem is the Rask is still not my favorite knife out there, but it is one of the most precision built things that I've ever handled. Like it is ridiculous, the level of detail that they're paying attention to. And that's really, really cool. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a question about whether that's the only thing that you care about in a knife. All right. So if you're still watching, those are my those are my top 10. If you're still watching, let me know about the high-end option that I missed or about the great budget knife that feels like it's over $1,000 that you happen to know about, you know, to add to the real steals that I mentioned earlier. I'll thank all of you for watching. I hope this list is helpful to you and, and informs your searching just a little bit. I know there are more companies we, we could and probably should mention, but those are the ones that kind of stand out as good ones to check with initially. And then you can kind of branch out from there as you begin to learn what you like and what you dislike and, and, you know, refine your tastes a little further. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to check the channel sponsors. Um, I'm going to throw, uh, of course, White Mountain Knives down there as well as Thunderbird Gear because a couple of the knives I showed you did come from uh, Steve over at Thunderbird Gear. We will talk to you soon.